What got you so interested in stories, John? I think it, I, I reverse engineered my way into it. It was learning the trauma narrative that played out in the human body 10, 15, 30 years later after the initial trauma. And so I've always thought stories were narrative, right? There's something I thought about. I did not understand that my body was keeping the score to quote Vander Kolk, right? That my body was revving up and fighting battles that I didn't even know was happening. And so we were looking at the long-term data, man, and people are having strokes and cancer and heart attacks from childhood experiences. And that made me step back and go, whoa, there's, there's these different layers to these stories happening all over the place. And it's not just narrative. It's the entire ecosystem that I call my body, right? My human experience. And then as I began to pull the thread on those, man, those stories we're born into and the stories we were told have such a formative shaping of our life experience. And those stories become the stories we tell ourselves, which as we all know in mental health professionals, that, that shapes everything. Who I think I am and what I think I'm capable or not capable of, or I'm the worst thing that ever happened to me. Those stories are highly limiting or they are the jet fuel on, an, on a well-lived life, right? So if we can discuss those stories, man, what a shape-shifting opportunity for us. Yeah, well, that idea about stories in some sense being stored in the body is kind of interesting. And so the way I conceptualize it is that a story manifests itself in a, in a personality, in a set of goals and a set of assumptions about the world, perceptions about the world. And if you have had terrible things happen to you in the past, and that's pretty much true of everyone, although some people more than others, then your body computes the present danger of the environment based on how many things have happened to you that are terrible in the past that, that aren't resolved. And resolved would mean that you had generated a solution for them. And if your psychophysiological system assumes that all the danger that you were subject to once is still present in the environment, then it's going to set you on edge as if you're walking in dangerous territory. And the psychophysiological consequence of that is that you're prepared for danger, and that does such things as burn up excess resources because you're much more reactive and on point than you might otherwise be in an anxiety-prone manner. It also suppresses immunological function because your body isn't that worried about long-term immunological health if you're confronting an emergency. And so that you talk in your book about changing your past, owning your past, and it's useful to define that you're likely to overcome a trauma, let's say, and no longer, in some sense, store it psychophysiologically if you've generated a causal story about the reason that the trauma emerged and then reconfigured the way that you're conducting your life so that the probability that a similar thing will happen to you is reduced to close to zero, right? It's not catharsis, right. it's understanding, yeah. The challenge there is, I think we've, following that thread all the way to our modern psychological ethos, we've created a world that is based entirely on blame and somebody else is responsible. And so I've got to continue to cut and cut and cut and I reduce myself to a two by two square with which I can exist. And if you enter my square, then whether it's ideologically or physically, then suddenly you're affronting me. And I think there's something about owning your past. I look at it more in terms of, can I think through what I remember to happen, have happened? And by the way, we know that memory is a disastrous like narrative storyteller, right? So I care less about what actually happened and more. I'm in my 40s. I'm telling myself this story that happened. Can I tell that story? Can I relive that story? And my body doesn't take off on me, right? It doesn't rush to solve the problem for me because it knows I'm driving now, right? The thing about memory is that it's not there to provide an accurate, objective record of the past, which is in fact impossible because the past is so unbelievably complex. It's more like a navigation tool, which is I went here, I fell into something terrible, and now I need to recalibrate the navigation map that I'm using so that I don't fall into the same hole. And you know, one of the things that people might want to know who are listening is that if you have a memory that's older than about 18 months and it haunts you, and when it comes up involuntarily, it produces a stress reaction. What that means is that as far as your nervous system is concerned, and so as far as your body's concerned, that danger hasn't gone away. And what's happening is an unconscious alarm system that's looking for pitfalls and holes is warning you that the map that you're using is incomplete in a manner that might, might enable you to fall into the same hole. And so one of the things that people can do that's very useful is 
if you have memories like that that plague you, is to bring them to mind voluntarily instead of waiting for them to come after you involuntarily, and then to think through what has changed and what might not have, but also to come up with a plan so that if a similar circumstance arose, you'd be in a better position in one way or another to deal with it. There's no other way of getting the memory to go away. Like, merely recontemplating it in the same manner over and over won't do it. And allowing it to plague you unconsciously, it'll do that forever until you solve it. It might show up in your dreams, it'll show up in your fantasies, it'll trigger you, so to speak, when you're talking to other people if they happen to discuss a topic that's related to it. And it's because that the narrative is one of failure and defeat, the event was one of failure and defeat, and if there isn't a map to allow you to transcend that that's functional, then the part of your brain that is concerned with identifying danger is never going to let you go. Yeah, and I, I think culturally we've created a pathology of discomfort. And as you just outlined so eloquently, the only way through this is to turn and face it and walk directly through it, right? And if you continue to run from the memories and pathologize and chase the behaviors, you end up with our over-diagnostic approach to everything instead of turning and facing these things and letting your body heal through relationships and other things in your life, man, we just end up chasing your tail. And you called it out. The more you run, the more your body thinks it's winning. It's getting away from this stuff. So it actually reinforces the anxiety. It reinforces some of these like psychological ailments the further you run from it. The only healing is through it. And in the culture we've created for ourselves says that uncomfortable discomfort is bad and it's to be avoided at all costs. It's the only path to healing. If you run, then the signal that the story you're acting out is that the thing you're running from is bigger than you and that you have to right. hide. And that's just a recipe for anxiety. Now, it's not necessarily that easy to turn and face something, but you do detail out a variety of strategies in your books that might help people do that. You can differentiate the problem. Like you might, you might have been traumatized at work, let's say, or let's not use that sort of jargony that jargony phraseology. You may be having tremendous difficulties at work. You might be dealing with people who are tyrannical at work and find it very meaningless. And so, and that's bothering you constantly. It's disturbing your sleep, for example, and it's haunting you. And you're, you tend to try to push it out of your mind when the thoughts come. And partly that's because the thought of ha getting a new job is so daunting that you can't face it. And one of the ways of re- calibrating that is to break down the problem into small and manageable steps. And so, for example, one of the things that you can do if you might have to consider getting a new job because you're unhappy and miserable at work is open up your resume or your CV and look at it, right? So you might not be able to get a new job, but you might be able to open up your resume and look at it. And then having done that, you've sort of cracked the surface and then maybe you could spend an hour a week for a month updating it or 10 minutes a day, or 10 minutes every two days, something like that. But part of the trick is to take these larger monsters that are frightening enough so you want to run away from them, decide that you're going to face the situation. You lay out, for example, in your book, you ask people a lot of different questions about what they're thinking. And if something is making you anxious and afraid and miserable, it's very useful to lay out, to write out all the reasons it's making you anxious and miserable, and to ask yourself, what is it you're afraid of? and then to develop a differentiated plan for dealing with those. 